America remains deeply divided over the outcome of its last presidential race and the violent attempts that followed to overturn the result. As midterm elections draw near, it reflects starkly opposing interpretations of freedom that threaten the nation's democratic consensus. In the first of two reports, Bob Apeshouse has been to investigate this bitter ideological clash and those seeking to exploit it. Donald Trump knew there were armed men in the mob that gathered on January 6, 2021 in Washington, D.C. to protest his loss of the presidential election. Make no mistake, this election was stolen from you, from me, and from the country. According to congressional testimony, Trump was deeply involved in efforts to disrupt the counting of electoral votes and hold on to power. But tens of millions of Republicans don't care about his attempted coup. They see Trump as a warrior for real Americans like them. There's never been a movement like this, ever, ever. And you're the real people. You're the people that built this nation. Over 80% of Republicans believe that America needs a strong leader to destroy radical and immoral currents prevailing in society. And a third that violence may be necessary to save the country. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Fight they did. The clash over freedom that erupted that day is central to the U.S. midterm elections this November and the authoritarian threat facing American democracy. And amidst all the throngs of people and violence was an unmistakable religious dimension that went mostly unnoticed. Trump is President, Christ is King! On January 6th, I was on a text chain with several different friends. And as we watched this footage, we started to, to comment like, hey, did you guys just see that Christian flag? Hey, did you guys just see that Jesus saves sign? It seemed very clear that white Christian nationalist ideology was motivating and driving a number of these participants. Samuel Perry, a former evangelical minister, is a professor at the University of Oklahoma. He is the co-author of a new book that uses polling data to examine Christian nationalism, the flag and the cross. White Christian nationalism is fundamentally authoritarian and it is anti-democratic. Uh, it is also conspiratorial. It's actually far more pervasive than many Americans understand and potentially could lead us uh, into a, uh, a lot of violent political situations. What percentage of the Republican Party do you think are white Christian nationalists? It is a comfortable majority of Republicans who would subscribe to the idea that America was founded as a Christian nation and that we should be in some way institutionalizing or privileging our Christian heritage and our identity uh, in American uh, law and policy going forward. You say that freedom, order, and violence are the holy trinity of white Christian nationalism. What do you mean? Christian nationalist ideology for white Americans is characterized by boundaries that distinguish bad guys from good guys, us versus them, and also arranges society in a series of hierarchies. Those people on the top are consistently white, Christian, native-born men. So it's the freedom for them. It's the order for the outsiders, culturally and religiously. And when that is violated, then good guys with guns can exercise righteous violence to maintain order. We set out to investigate how and why freedom is under siege in the U.S. and where it is taking the country. Our first stop was Salem, Oregon, where the Reawaken America Tour held a modern-day Christian revival in April. Clay Clark, a successful entrepreneur, is the empresario and organizer of the tour. Tens of thousands have attended 14 reawakened gatherings since they began in 2021, while countless more have watched on Christian and right-wing internet sites. And this event is going to be the spark of revival for this state. So we're going to learn a lot about election fraud, medical fraud, religious fraud, monetary fraud, all that. One of the headliners of the event was General Michael Flynn, Trump's former national security advisor who was prosecuted for lying to the FBI and pardoned by the former president. We are in a fight for the heart and soul of this country right now. Everybody feels it, everybody knows it. 
reawaken events have been showcases for some of the leading purveyors of conspiracy theories about COVID-19 and the 2022 presidential election. We have to focus on the problem, and the problem right now is the elections have been stolen. Your voice was stolen. Clark has developed an elaborate narrative linking COVID-19 and vaccinations to a satanic conspiracy by global elites to deprive people of their freedom. This is Klaus Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum, openly stating in 2015 they will put shots inside your body that will change you. That's what it's all about. They want to edit you in the image, not of God, but in the image of these nefarious Luciferians. Many evangelical Christians in the U.S. fear the COVID vaccine could be the mark of the beast, identifying them as followers of the Antichrist in the end times. You have Team Satan versus Team Jesus. That's why I'm doing this. I'm trying to give you tools to wake up your family. Underscoring the importance of Christian nationalists to the Republican Party and Donald Trump's MAGA movement was the appearance of his son, Eric. Wow. You know, we want our religion back. We want our Constitution back. We want our Second Amendment back. And guys, I promise we're going to make this country great again. Oh, the Holy Ghost is flowing right now. Lance Wallnow, a charismatic evangelist, was another popular speaker at the event. Do you know why they freaked out over January 6th? To send you a message. You're never to show up with your strength ever again in their face. Wallnow was one of the pastors who came to Washington to protest on January 6th. It's like Donald Trump said to me. He believed that Christians were the secret to the future of America. But you guys got to get organized. In 1976, 80% of Americans identified as white Christians. Today, that number is less than 45%. Secularism is on the rise. Non-white racial minorities are, are, are growing in terms of the percentage of population. And America is slowly moving leftward politically. They are also concerned with this idea of replacement, that immigrants are coming to the country who tend to vote Democrat, and that the Democrats are behind this plot to replace true Americans. Uh, by that they mean people like us. Warnings about globalization and technological advance were a big part of this meeting. So were claims that COVID isn't real, that elites are engaged in deception. How does that fit in with white Christian nationalist ideology? This is a part of their theology of the end times, that there is an effort on the part of Satan and his workers to unite the world together, to oppose God's people, and to curtail your freedom. So white Christian nationalism inclines Americans toward conspiratorial thinking. It is highly suspect of those who have historically been in charge. So the media elite, the political elite, the academics. People at the Reawaken event think it's Democrats and liberals who are the authoritarians. Suppressing information about the vaccines, suppressing information about where the virus came from, suppressing the news. I think America is responding to authoritarianism right now. This is what this event is doing. Do you think there's a battle going on in America between good and evil? Absolutely. So the evil side, I believe, is um, people who do not want the God element in America. They're, they're politicians who don't, they don't want God and Christianity to upset their agendas. Do you think the election was stolen in 2020? Absolutely. You do? Absolutely. I have articles on people that have done data 70% of Republicans believe the 2000 presidential election was stolen from Donald Trump. I mean, ballots showing up on streets kind of is an indicator that there's something going on in dumpsters and things like that. Uh -huh, so where did you hear about that? Um, I mean, there was a lot of it all over, just random posts on Facebook, YouTube, just random streams, you know. What did you think of the attack on the Capitol on January 6th? Uh, attack. <laughs> they were all let in. When you look at other people's videos that they've taken, it was just as peaceful as this. So the notion of, of it being an insurrection? There was none. I don't think there was one. From the January 6th attack to the 2020 election to COVID-19 vaccination, conspiracy is in the air that people breathe on the Reawaken America tour. Um, I don't know that uh, conspiracy theories is how to describe it. I would just say 
Uh, people who are here are speaking about election fraud, medical fraud, religious fraud, monetary fraud, mainstream media fraud, and those are all things that are definitely happening right now. What is the crux of the opposition to vaccination and the concern about COVID, that it's being used to restrict freedoms? I think that COVID-19 is the moment when Americans will agree to put surveillance technology underneath their skin. Does that mean it's a plan? Is it, I, I, definitely, I definitely know that COVID-19 is a plan, yes. When a million people in America died of COVID, it's been shown that the people that had the vaccine had lower hospitalization rates and lower death rates. I don't trust those statistics. Are you concerned at all that all of the discussion about the stolen election is delegitimizing the whole uh, electoral process? No. Why do you think most people come to the Reawaken America tour events? I think there's people who are previously not politically active that are coming here because they're seeking the truth. That's why I'm doing the tour, is to waken people up to the truth. In almost every case, I think, that you can look at, authoritarian governments flourish on irrationality. They flourish on disinformation. Benjamin Hett, a professor of history at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, is the author of several books about Nazi Germany. The Death of Democracy explores similarities between conditions in America today and in the Weimar Republic when Hitler took over. There really is a sort of basic structural similarity between how um, uh, conspiracy theories and misinformation lies, appeals to irrational factors, how all of that functioned in Weimar Germany and how it functions in America today. And also the 1920s was an age of a kind of media revolution. Film was new, radio was new. So there is this kind of media explosion which felt to people at the time much like the internet or social media feels to us and had a similar impact in terms of making it much easier to spread information including disinformation. The danger social media poses in spreading disinformation has been compounded during the Trump years by the emergence of a separate universe of sites to serve the political right, and a new internet medium that has largely flown under the radar, podcasting. So you can call out yeah. all the Trump votes you want and put them in a file right. called an adjudicative file and then just throw it away. There are no regulations. You can say whatever you want in this medium and that's what they did around the election. Valerie Wirtschafter is a senior data analyst at the Brookings Institution. She led a study on how podcasts spread Trump's claim that the 2020 election was stolen from him. Now I'd say around 40% of Americans listen to a podcast monthly which is more than people who use Twitter, about the same as those that use Instagram monthly. The Brookings team recorded, transcribed, and analyzed some 1,500 podcast episodes between August 2020 and the January 6 attack on the Capitol. We have many more conservative podcasters just simply because the ecosystem is larger and because there's so much more content there. Right here is when we have our election and we see a huge spike in terms of the number of podcasters sharing content tied to election fraud. And at some points, 60% of the episodes that we looked at are sharing false content. The Democrat Party had a coordinated stuff the ballot box strategy. This has been an amazing day out in Washington, D.C. at the Stop the Seal March for Trump. People who are not eligible to vote sneak in, they vote anyway. We know that. Voter fraud is real, everybody. Don't let them tell you otherwise. Play tape. So all of this totally bogus information about the election is going out on these podcasts to millions of people. Yeah. The Steve Bannon Show claims on their website they've been downloaded, I think, 135 million times. He's kind of this outlier up here with nearly 118 shows dedicated, at least in part, to disseminating big lie content. What Hitler said in Mein Kampf, and it's a very interesting passage, is that if you tell a big enough lie, voters will think that's too big to be a lie. He couldn't possibly be lying. It must be true. Democrats attempted the most brazen and outrageous election theft in, in American history. Everybody knows it. Also very astutely, Hitler said, even if the lie is then later debunked, it will linger in the minds of people who have been exposed to it. It's very hard ever to eradicate it once it's there. And Trump understands that you need to go big with the lie, be persistent about it, and that it'll stick once you've put it in there. And we've seen it has stuck. It's now very per pervasive on the right, very widely believed by a majority of Republicans. 
In response to Trump's big lie, Republicans across the U.S. have pushed through changes to voting laws and election administration that Democrats see as a threat to the very foundation of American freedom, majority rule. Georgia has been at the forefront of the Republican effort. In 2021, the Republican legislature here passed SB 202, the so-called Election Integrity Act. The New Georgia Project, a voting rights group that has registered more than 500,000 new voters since 2014, is dealing with fallout from the legislation. We're monitoring about 200 polling locations and in this new anti-voter, anti-democratic environment, it is extraordinarily important that we have eyes and ears on as many polling locations as possible. Nse Ufo is CEO of the New Georgia Project. During elections last May to finalize congressional and state candidates, she and her team were busy helping people navigate hurdles presented by the new voting laws. There are over 50 changes to Georgia's laws that we have seen because of Senate Bill 202. They want to get rid of absentee balloting, and we're still seeing long lines. We're seeing polling locations that have been changed, again, without giving voters the proper notice. And they've cut 100 days from the early voting timeline. So the ambition of SB 202 is to shave off votes at the margins because the former president lost in Georgia by less than 12,000 votes. That's pushed Biden's lead over 1,000 now statewide. So what do you see as a connection between this voter suppression than race. That in a place like Georgia, black voters make up 35% of the electorate, that by 2025, we're talking about white people no longer being the majority in Georgia. So what does that mean? That in the marketplace of ideas, fewer and fewer people are buying what conservative Republicans are selling. And the only way for them to hold on to power is if they cheat. Since 2021, Republicans in 17 states have passed 33 restrictive voting laws that can disproportionately affect voters of color. 20 states have enacted laws allowing Republicans to interfere with election operations or overturn election results. So many of the Republican-controlled states that pass laws making it harder to vote follow the Georgia template. Ari Berman is the author of Give Us the Ballot, The Modern Struggle for Voting Rights in America. He is working on a new book exploring Republican efforts to establish minority rule in the U.S. I think it's very simple. You don't have to rely on minority rule if you have policies that are appeal to a majority. Uh, but they've given up trying to have policies that are broadly popular, and they've also given up trying to play by established rules of American politics. What do you think is most problematic in terms of, of suppression and subversion in the Georgia law? They've changed the law in all sorts of different ways to make it harder to vote. But the ultimate voter suppression tactic is throwing out votes on the back end, right? And now you have the heavily gerrymandered state legislature gets to control a majority of appointees to the state board of elections, which oversees how elections are certified. At the same time, you have local boards of elections that are either becoming more Republican or believe the election was stolen. What that can mean is that Republicans who don't believe in certifying elections if their side loses, will then be in, in charge of certifying them. Griffin is the main town in Spalding County, one of six counties in Georgia whose local election boards were restructured to favor Republicans since 2021. So after the 2020 election, there was a lot of tension around here. Yes, we went from uh, three people coming to our meetings to maybe 25, 50 people coming. Vera McIntosh served as the chairman of the Spalding Election Board and Glenda Henley was a member. Both are Democrats and the pressure on the board because of Trump's claim of election fraud in Georgia was intense. We had some dumpster diving to try and find votes that the board had thrown into the dumpster and they needed to go into the dumpster to find out where those votes were. And they did not find any. So that's interesting. I mean, Trump won about 65% of the vote here. Yes. Right. So we couldn't understand what the problem was here. He won Spalding County. Traditionally, the election board had five members, two Democrats and two Republicans, with the fifth chosen by a coin toss. In 2020, this resulted in three black Democratic women forming the majority. What role do you think race played in people's anger over the election? I think that race played quite a bit in the sense that the makeup of the elections board at that time 
was total minority that was in control. So the powers that be wanted to change that dynamic. The state legislature passed a bill to allow local elected judges to pick the fifth member of the Spalding Election Board rather than have it decided by a coin toss. They selected someone who sided with the Republicans, giving them control of the board. So that happened not just in Spalding County, but other counties in Georgia. Yes. These were all election boards that were controlled by minority people. McIntosh and Henley resigned. The new Republican chairman of the Spalding board is Ben Johnson, the CEO of a local IT company. His social media posts suggest he is an election denier. Mr. Johnson declined our request for an interview. So did Republican state legislators who spearheaded the new voting laws in Georgia. A major change implemented by the new Spalding election board is the elimination of Sunday voting during the early voting period. For years, churches in the African-American community have encouraged their congregants to vote after Sunday services. It's known as souls to the polls. If you see there's a defect in the system, take that hand and go to a voting booth and cast your vote. Pastor Jared Duff has led the Rising Star Missionary Baptist Church in Griffin since 2004. There's been a concerted effort to stop Sunday voting, um, and I think it's no coincidence that that happens when you see a large African-American segment that finally stood up and taking a, a major role in the democratic process. I went out to this Reawaken America tour. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a revival. I mean, you know, one of the main messages is that COVID was invented to steal rights, to take away freedom. COVID is real. Our congregation, we have been affected by COVID. I believe that God empowered men and women to come up with various ways to treat this disease. And so for us to say that we reject it and we think it's a plot and a conspiracy, I think it's folly. What's your view of white evangelical pastors who are rallying their troops for the Republican cause? I think the white evangelical Christian movement um, that support Donald Trump and his ilk have whitewashed the gospel. And what I mean by that is, um, it's fine as long as we keep the white evangelical or just white on top. As long as we're in the positions of power, everything is good. But if the playing field gets leveled in any type of way, now all of a sudden there is this upheaval. And so what's happened, the political climate has exposed really who we are. The Christian right. Uh, mobilized by Christian nationalist ideology has a decision to make. They can, um, they can change their values and change their platform, or they can shore up enough fear and anger to change the rules of the game, to sideline or handicap their opponents. And that's an authoritarian agenda. That is an authoritarian regime. That is actually how that starts. And the more white Americans subscribe to Christian nationalism, the more they believe that voting is not a right, it is a privilege. In other words, it's not something that shall not be infringed, but it's something that we can actually limit or take away altogether. Mail-in voting is the most corruptible process in the world. And I've been working with concerned citizens to ensure election integrity. Everybody that comes by here tells me, oh, this system is so corrupted. A lot of people are concerned that efforts by Republicans in a number of states are actually undermining democracy. I don't think so. It's not secure. We need to make sure it's secure. In other countries, they get fingerprints to make sure it's secure. This November, 87 Republicans in battleground states are running for offices that will play a key role in certifying the 2024 presidential race. 54 of them support the big lie that the election was stolen from Trump. Donald Trump's big lie has poisoned the Republican Party at every level of the political process. The results of the 2022 election are going to go a long way toward deciding what kind of democracy we have. Because so many critical races are up. Not just control of Congress, but control of really important state races that determine who certifies elections, who writes election laws. It was a very haphazard effort to try to steal the election in 2020. Now they're getting more sophisticated. They're trying to take the insurrection and institutionalize it in all of these key swing states and ultimately at the national level as well. A vote could absolutely be stolen here. 
There's no doubt in my mind that if we do not remain vigilant, if we do not call out this bad behavior, if we do not have overwhelming participation in our elections this year, that we will have a future of stolen elections and it could mean the end of American democracy as we know it.